morning. As we start off this morning, I want to take a minute uh, and reflect back on what this weekend means, why it's significant. Uh, a lot of times this weekend is kind of thrown into a three-day weekend with a trip to the beach or a picnic or a, a holiday or a cookout. And all those things in themselves are not bad at all. But I also want to make sure that we don't miss uh, the importance of what this weekend means for us as a church. That we have the opportunity to minister to many this weekend who don't view this weekend as a fun, outgoing opportunity. That this is a reminder of a really difficult time in their lives. Where they lost somebody they served with in battle, a friend, a family member, a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife. And I want us to take a minute to pray over those in the room that I know are affected by that. I'm not naive enough to think that nobody in here uh, has dealt with this. I know that many of us have either known somebody or are closely tied with somebody who's lost in battle. So I want to pray over you before we start this morning. Take that time to do that, and then we'll jump in. Will you pray with me? Father, on this Memorial Day weekend, we want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for the freedom that we find in Christ and the freedom that we find in this country because of the men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice as well. We, uh, we lift up their families who carry on without them, their friends who carry on without them. It's easy to forget. So many of us don't know the, the pain or the cost that comes with freedom. And so today, this weekend, we remember their sacrifice and a debt that we can't repay. I want to pray that you will comfort those who have lost friends, family, loved ones that served our nation. May we always be reminded of their sacrifice, not just once a year. God, give us eyes to see those who are broken and hurting around us. If there's a heart that breaks for those and compassion to love people through this really difficult time. May we step up as a church to love people well. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. So, for those of you uh, who don't know who I am, my name is Chris. I get to serve as the youth pastor here at the church. It's an honor to share with you. Uh, if you don't know who I am or you're new, um, I teach all the time that I teach on stage. I teach without shoes on. That's weird to some people, so I want to make sure I explain why that happens. Um, so in Scripture, we're shown in the book of uh, Exodus and Joshua, amongst a few other places, um, that when people are in the presence of God, that they remove their shoes because they believe that they are standing on holy ground. I believe that when we stand in this place, where you sit today, that you are on holy ground, that God is here, that he is in our presence, he is in our midst, and out of reverence for him and in prayerful obedience, I remove my sandals as well as a sign of worship and respect to him. So I don't want you to be weirded out by that. Some of you probably are because maybe you aren't feet people and that's fine. My eyes are here, all right? I have a brother, if you don't know, I have a, a two-year-old -er brother. I have a two-year-old brother. I have a brother who's two years older than me. He's a pastor out in West Texas, which if you don't know what West Texas looked like, just imagine a sandbox with buildings in it. There you go. That's West Texas. So he's been out there for six years ministering uh, out there, and he's loved it. But we grew up together. We were homeschooled, which probably tells you a lot about why I am the way I am. Just one homeschool family got that. So <laughs> they were like, yeah, that's true, man. That's fine. Right? But growing up, we had all of our classes together because, uh, well, we were it, you know? I won science fair every year. It's the best in my class. <laughs> my principal would always write glowing reviews of how I was better than everybody else. It's great. But here's the cool thing. My mom was teaching us geography one time. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And she was standing before us. There was a big map on the wall, and she was helping us learn the 50 states and their capitals. Now, I don't know any of them anymore outside of like our capital and a couple other ones, but I don't I watched a video this week of a guy who can like recite alphabetically all the states in like 16 seconds. Nah, like maybe 16 minutes and a map in front of me and I got you. But other than that, I'm out, right? 
So she's trying to teach us all of these different things. My brother's on a rocking chair, one of those old wicker rocking chairs, and he's rocking, and I'm sitting on the couch. Like a good, loving, considerate, kind brother, I'm encouraging him to go faster. So he's rocking. My mom's got her back to us. I'm going faster, go faster, see how fast you can go. So he's rocking like this. I'm just sitting here going, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it happened. The greatest moment in my life as a brother. My brother fell backwards on the rocking chair and smacked his face. When I tell you that his teeth were showing through right here, it was awesome. Don't, don't awe him, he's fine. He's got a really sweet scar right here. His teeth came through this little soft portion right between your lip and your chin. And I start laughing hysterically. I am uncontrollably laughing. He is uncontrollably crying, blood everywhere. My mom is going back and forth between beating me and helping him. And it was the greatest day as a brother. I think this is a really good picture of us this morning. I want you guys to flip over to the book of Colossians. If you have a, a Bible in the a chair in front of you, it's page 712, Colossians chapter 2. We've been going through the book of Colossians in this series that we've titled Director's Chair. Who are you or what are you placing in the place of the director? Now we recognize and believe that God is the director of all things, regardless of whether you believe in him or not, and that God is orchestrating all things together for his glory. And what we're going to see in Paul's message this morning to the church at Colossae is something probably you've heard maybe a thousand times if you've ever been in church before. But it's something that I hope we can shed fresh light on this morning. And it's this, that you have been set free. Now maybe you've heard this a thousand times, but this morning you're not living like it. This morning you're still living trapped by what other people say about you or to you. So I want to read a little, talk a little, and let's see what God teaches us this morning. So let's look at Colossians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 16. Paul says, So don't let anyone condemn or judge you for what you eat or drink. We're not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anybody condemn or judge you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. Paul's basic command right off the cuff is simple. He repeats it twice. Do not let anyone condemn or judge you for what you eat, what you drink, or what you do. Don't let anybody do it. But here's the truth that I've learned, at least in my personal life, is that we don't get to control what other people do or say. We don't get to control the attitudes or actions of other people. But what we do get to control is our response to it. So even though I don't get to control what you're going to do or say to me, I do get to control what I'm going to say or do back. And that's what Paul's getting after here. He's saying, don't let anybody condemn you or judge you. They're going to do it. He doesn't say, nobody's going to, right? He says, don't let them have authority in your life that they don't deserve to have. The false teachers are trying to get these guys to do certain rules and regulations that were no longer even biblical or relevant because Christ had come. And really they were fighting on, on two battlegrounds. One on uh, the diet, on what they eat, right? They were fighting about what they eat or drink. And secondly, about their holy days, when they celebrate. But here's the thing that's interesting. On the surface, these things seem super spiritual. To a, to a culture that was following the, the law, right, which is Genesis, Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, to the, to the people who are following the law, these seemed like significant things. They seemed spiritual. But when Christ entered the scene, the law became him instead. A relationship with him 
not obedience to the law was important. You know the number one question I get from students? How did people in the Old Testament get saved? How do we know they're in heaven? Didn't they have to do all those laws in order to get to heaven? Why don't we come to church anymore and put a lamb up here and slaughter it before we start worship? Wouldn't that be more biblical? The people in the Old Testament became believers the same way you and I do. The law wasn't important for obedience to the law was important. See, God requires the same thing he requires of you and me now. Obedience and belief. That's it. So it wasn't, oh, you only did 612? You're not a Christian. Sorry, you don't get to go to heaven. 613 laws, you only did 610? Eh, you're out. No, it was the heart that mattered, not the action. So Paul says, don't let them condemn you. Don't let them judge you for what you do or what you say. Because here's the thing. If human effort was what mattered, then Jesus didn't have to come. If human effort was what got us to heaven, then the work of God is unnecessary and void. Are you, is anybody, um, anybody a Peter Pan fan? Oh, a couple people. Good, good. Some cultured people in this service. First service, either didn't like him or didn't know who he was. Either way, that's silly. Peter Pan is hands down one of the greatest legacies of uh, cartoon characters ever. The thing about Peter Pan that's so beautiful is his shadow. It's this playful, fun, exciting shadow that just kind of runs around and does its own thing. It's different than mine and your shadow, right? Our shadow just kind of like, like here's my, I don't, you can't see it. It's right there. That's my shadow, right? Nobody's like, yay, your shadow. Like if I was just backstage and all my shadow was out, he'd be like, man, this is kind of boring. I don't want to watch your shadow. Why? Because the shadow is only a temporary thing until the actual substance arrives. A shadow is inferior to the actual thing that it's representing. A shadow is not actual substance. It's just the image of it. And this is what, in verse 17, Paul's getting after. Take a look back at verse 17. These rules, these regulations, are only a shadow of the reality yet to come. And check this out. And Christ himself is that reality. You see, if I had your favorite food, and I had a shadow of your favorite food, which one would you take? Now, some of you, look, I hear you. Some of you might say, Chris, I'm on a diet. I would take the shadow, less <laughs> calories. I get it. But I think we all know just because we eat the shadow doesn't make us full. We're going to have to keep eating the shadow. And we know that the more shadows we eat, the more cal like we get it, right? Look, you want the food. All of us want the actual substance, not the reflection of it, right? This is what Paul's saying. The Old Testament covenant, the Old Testament law, was a shadow that pointed forward to something greater. The law served its purpose, and it still does today. It exposes our brokenness, it reveals God's character, and it points us to Jesus. The law does perfectly what it is intended to do but it was only a shadow, not the substance. And so Paul says, don't follow the rules and regulations. Instead, recognize the substance has come. The false teacher is telling him, look what they said, like, do these pious self-denials, worship angels. These visions have told us that you need to follow us. But Jesus, not experiences, determine our holiness. It doesn't matter how many self-disciplines, how many angels you worship, which you shouldn't do that if that's something you're thinking you should do. None of that matters. Jesus defines holiness and nothing else. So why were they so easy to convince otherwise? I would argue that it's the immaturity of the church at Colossae that the immaturity of the church led them 
to believe false teachings. It's the same thing is true in our churches as well today. That's the reason why some pastors will get up and say, if you truly love Jesus, you'll buy me a jet. Which if that's what you think, I need a jet. So I'm going to milk that one. I hope. Just kidding. I don't need a jet. But when we don't know the truth, we're susceptible to the lie. And for you and I, I think we got to understand that if we're not spending time growing, reading, spending time with other believers, then we are equally going to be susceptible to believe or even worse, practice the false teaching of other people. We're going to begin to believe the lies that people begin to put before us. And I want to challenge you in that thought pattern. How are you growing in your relationship with Jesus? What are, you, what are you doing to help grow the relationship that you've had? If I just met a girl and said, I'm going to get married, and I never got to know her, that relationship would still be valid. I'd still have a relationship with her, but we're not growing together. And eventually that relationship is going to be severed. We're not going to be able to maintain a relationship where we're not growing together. Same is true of Jesus. And so Paul says, here's something really important, right? Don't let anybody condemn you. Don't do all these other things. Recognize that it's Jesus that matters. And here's, man, let me just, let me just throw this at you. There are good things in our lives that we fill the void to try to make us satisfied or to try to find our identity. This is where other people come in, right? What do you think about me? What do you say about me? Am I good enough for you? But, but here's the thing. There's other things in our lives, right? Jobs, sports, family, these things that are good things. They're not inherently evil things. But when those good things become little g God things, idols, when good things become little g God things in our lives, they replace the God they were intended to reflect. Did you catch that? When good things become little g God things, idols in our lives, they replace the God they were intended to reflect. They become a shadow. Or instead of chasing the substance, we chase the shadow. Let's take a look at verse 20. It says, you have died with Christ. And he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide, check this out, no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Here's the beautiful thing. Our, our freedom comes on the heels of Jesus' death. Verse 20, right? If you're going to memorize a verse this morning, this is the one. You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. That death brings freedom. But look at what else he does. He quotes this guy in 21, right? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. This is a classic Paul argument. If you've read any other Paul writings, I'd encourage you to read the whole Bible. But specifically Acts 17, Paul walks into this place in Athens and they have this image to the unknown God. He says, would you like to know who that is? I would like to take your culture and help you understand why you're wrong and why the unknown God is the only God you should know. In 1 Corinthians 7, he quotes these guys who are talking about marriage and sexuality. He says, would you like to know why they're wrong and why what God has ordained for marriage and sexuality is correct? Let me show that to you. He takes their arguments, shows the holes in them, and provides truth to fill the void. Substance to fill the void. But here's the thing. For a lot of us, Instead of living in the freedom that Christ has offered, we willingly, we willingly worship lesser things than Christ. We willingly display false worship. We put on our smiles, we come to church, we act like everything's great. We check it off our list. 
rather than humbly seeking Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. They willingly destroyed their bodies in the name of religious experience. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Allergies are awful, amen? <laughs> Only one person has allergies, awesome. <coughs> when we give Jesus control of our lives, he not only gives us the Holy Spirit to fight against the flesh, but he gives us new desires as well. He helps us understand what we are intended to be and what we are intended to worship. So then we have to ask the question, what other people are you allowing to sit in the chair? For some of us, it's the person of legalism. It's the person, what I would call a checklist Christian. Back in the day, <coughs> man, I'm dying up here, I'm so sorry. Back in the day, there used to be these cute little tithe cards. And on them, there would be a checklist of things like, did you read your Bible this week? Did you pray this week? Did you go to church this week? Did you tell somebody about Jesus this week? And you had to come in, like, check those boxes, and then hand that card in. And man, how, like, terrifying is that, right? If somebody's judging you for that. Nobody gets to judge you, right, except for Jesus. Jesus isn't looking at you going, oh, you didn't read your Bible this morning? Mm. Mm -mm. Now, if you haven't read your Bible in a year, let's have a conversation. But you're like, oh man, today got away from me. Well, read tomorrow. Spend time in the Word, but don't do it in such a way that you feel like if you don't check that box, God somehow doesn't love you anymore. For some of you this morning, maybe that's not it. For some of you this morning, you're, you're seeking some sort of mystical experience. Maybe you're going to a psychic or trying to find some weird way of worship to try to really, hopefully, find Jesus in that. Like maybe you're looking for him on a piece of uh, toast. Like, oh, there's Jesus, now I believe. Oh, thank you. That's super nice. Maybe some of you are seeking to find your identity, your fulfillment, and what other people say about you. This is a hard one to fight because we want people to like us. We want people to love us. And when they don't, get our feelings hurt. When you allow somebody else to speak your worth, you lose the fact that you're valued in the eyes of God. Are you worshiping lesser things than Christ? Are you taking those good things and making them little G God things? You know, Pastor Matt's been bragging for the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> I think it's all lies. That he was in a movie in Italy who films movies in Italy? <laughs> I was in a real movie, a Disney movie, and I actually have real proof, so until Matt, you know, coughs up the proof, I believe none of it. <clears throat> Check this out. Here I am. Oh, no, not the front guy. That's not me. That's Joe Edgerton, really good actor. I'm sure he's, he's got a lot more money than I do. I'm the guy on the left there. You see me back there? That's 20-something-year-old that's Chris. He real cute. I was what's called an extra. That basically means worthless in the English language. It's totally fine. An extra in a movie serves a role, a purpose. You're a filler. You're a background actor. So in essence, uh, I don't have any lines. I don't talk in the movie. I just stand there and uh, act like I'm making pencils. That's, that's what I'm doing in that scene right there. I'm real good at it too. But here's the thing. As a background actor, I don't actually know the story. I don't actually know what's happening. Honestly, when I got there, I thought the movie was about pencils. Because I didn't get a script. I don't know the storyline. I just thought, cool, a movie about pencils. It's going to be great. It's not. It's actually a movie about a kid who comes out of the ground. and It's weird. Anyways, it's a great movie. Go watch it. It's the Odd Life of Timothy Green. It's fantastic. Either way. The thing about being a, a background actor is that you have to follow the direction of the director. If, if you do, then you get to become part of a story that's bigger than you could have ever imagined. I became part of a, a narrative that I didn't really understand when I got there. But now, it makes perfect sense. <coughs> Sorry, man, I'm really struggling up here. But here's the cool thing. A lot of us are living the same way. 
We're living the life of an extra. We're on the outside looking in, trying to figure out what's this grand story that matters so much. And we look at other people who have joy and peace and comfort. We wonder, how do we get that? And they have that because they've submitted to the director. So I want to ask some questions as we close out. The band's going to come back up to lead us in one more song. How do we get these people out of our chairs? How do we begin to live our lives free from the oppression of other people? <clears throat> First, I would say you have to live in the freedom that Christ has given you. Not in the checklist that somebody else did. Secondly, I would say find your identity and purpose in what God has made you to be. If you were to find a remix student, over the last 12 weeks, we've been studying the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We just ended this past week. If you were to ask them, what is your purpose in life? Do you know what a remix student would tell you? They would not say to make a lot of money, to have a cool job, to marry a good-looking wife or husband. They would say their purpose in life is to worship. They were created to worship. And guess what? So are you. Some of you are struggling with purpose and mission. What am I made for? Why am I here? You are here to worship the God who created you. You're here to reflect his worth and value. You are here because God wants you here for a reason. And your mission is to go and to tell. See, oftentimes we get lost in all the things that we have to do in our lives. And we miss the beautiful truth that God values us. He loves us. And he created each one of us for a reason, for a purpose. You are not a mistake. You are not trash. You are valuable because you reflect the God who's valuable. You know what's crazy to me? That a lot of us are on the rocking chair today. A lot of us are facing backwards on the rocking chair. And the cool thing is, the director's right in front of you. But we're listening to the voices beside of us. We're listening to the things that are spoken to us. Rather than seeing the value that's been placed on us because of the director. And we're rocking, and we're rocking, and we're rocking, and we're listening to the voices, and we're listening to the things in our head that say, you're not good enough, you're not valuable enough, you don't matter in this world, you don't have a reason, you don't have a purpose, you don't have a mission, you just need to go. And instead of hearing the voice of God saying, I've created you, I've made you, I love you, and I want you to live your life in such a way that honors and glorifies me, we hear the voices that say, you don't need to live your life. I work with a group of students, listen, 15 to 24 years old. It's the highest rate of suicide in America because they don't believe that they are valuable, that they matter, and that God loves them and has a plan for them. Church, we have got to recognize that we have value in who Jesus is, not what people say about you. But the truth of the matter is that we're rocking on the chair backwards, and guess what? At one point, the chair's going to fall, and you're going to be on your face before the director, whether you like it or not. And the question for you is, will it be in a posture of worship? Or will it be groveling, begging that he would still forgive you on that day of judgment when it's too late? Philippians tells us, Paul says in Philippians, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's just a matter of when. It's a matter of how. Church, you have the opportunity this morning to release the people beside you. Say, I'm not going to hear these voices. I'm going to focus on the director. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship. God, I pray for those sitting in this room this morning who are struggling to find their purpose and their mission and their value in life. <clears throat> Jesus, help them find it in you. Help them to see that your presence is all that matters. That your victory is all that matters. That their hope needs to rest in you, not in the things they do, the words they say, but in the thing that you have done through the cross. Their hope rests in that. And that alone. Jesus, give us confidence to live in that. Boldness to believe it. 
We love you. In your name. Amen.